so today I'm going to talk to you a bit about sort of my research objective and what I've been really working towards over the last uh, five to ten years in Bermuda. And really how that relates across the Caribbean and how we can apply some of these ideas here in Cayman. So my whole research agenda revolves under this umbrella of coral resilience. And when I mean resilience, it's the ability of these organisms to survive and tolerate some sort of stressful event. So a stressful event could be a heating event, it could be a hurricane. Um, so the ability for corals to survive this stress. But then also, if they are impacted by such stresses, it's their ability to then recover afterwards from it. So within this umbrella of resilience, I'm interested in what's going on at depth. Um, because, as we'll talk about a little bit later, corals at depth are experiencing very different environmental conditions than they're experiencing in the shallows. So looking at how are these corals that are residing on deep reefs resilient against current stressors that are impacting reefs worldwide. And so within that, I'm looking at a few key questions. So they all fall in within either community composition, which is going down and really assessing who's there, who are the players in the community, what species are there, and how many of them are there. And then the next thing that I look at is how are they surviving and how are these different players impacted by stress. And then particularly I'm interested in reproduction because populations can't be maintained or persist over time without reproducing. So this is one of those key processes that I investigate. And then finally, can these deep reefs actually serve as a refuge in the future for the survival of coral reefs in the face of global climate change? So we have, are all familiar, I think, at this point with the global decline in coral reefs over the last several decades. And this has been particularly pronounced in the Caribbean. And since the 1970s, we've seen a decline from about 70 to 80% coral cover on our reefs to around an average of 5 to 10% Caribbean wide. So this is a drastic loss in not only biodiversity, um, but really structural complexity to our reef systems. So why is this occurring? Well, one of the key things that allows corals to survive is this symbiosis that they have with single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. So these little tiny algal cells, which you can see over here, live inside the tissue of the little polyps. So this is, you know, you can go from this large colony, and it's made up of thousands of these little polyps, and inside each one of those polyps are these algal cells. And they're photosynthesizing and producing energy that they then give to those corals. And they can actually provide up to 99% of the energy that's required for these corals to survive. So they're really important for this association to occur. In return, you know, you're not going to live somewhere if you don't get a benefit. You're not going to give everything to your partner and not get anything back. Um, so in return, they get things like ammonia, like excretory waste products from the coral. So it's mutually beneficial. What's happening, however, under stressful conditions is that these algae are being kicked out of the coral. So the coral finds that under stressful conditions, the algae start sort of photosynthesizing in the wrong way. They start producing toxic components, and the coral says, forget about it. I don't want you anymore. Get out of here. Well, it turns out this is a bad strategy because they need those algae for energy. And so if they can't get new algae back, within a certain amount of time, then the coral will die. So this is sort of what it looks like. You have a healthy coral. You know, it's full of tissue. Sometimes you're diving, you can see all the polyps are out, waving around and feeding. When it bleaches, it loses all those algae, and the coral, in fact, becomes completely stark white. And then over time, if it doesn't replenish those algae, it will become overgrown uh, with macroalgae. And we've actually, unfortunately, been seeing an increase in bleaching occurring across global reef systems. And this is directly linked to the increase in global heat content in our oceans. So we can now say with relative certainty that these bleaching events are the result of increasing sea surface temperature. And you can see that we had our first global bleaching event that affected coral reefs across the globe in 1998. And then there was a long time frame before there was another one of these global bleaching events. But since 2010, there was another one in 2015, and then another one in 2016, and they're probably pr projecting that we'll have another one this year as well as the oceans continue to warm. And probably the most devastating case that we have is what happened in 2015 on the Great Barrier Reef, 
where we had this massive bleaching event that extended across the entire length of the Great Barrier Reef and resulted in 67% mortality in the northern region of the Great Barrier Reef. So this is a huge issue that coral reefs are facing and is resulting in a big change in how they're functioning and how they can protect our coastlines and serve our tourist industry and protect our commercially important fish species. Um, and just to show you a bit of what that looked like in Australia, it happened really quickly. So we had healthy reefs in December and then bleached in February. And by August, they were covered in macroalgae. So what's interesting is this isn't happening everywhere. There are places that are doing OK. They seem to be resilient. And we're calling them hope spots. So what is it about these locations that makes them more resilient to the impacts of climate change or the impacts of any other kind of stressor that, that these reefs might be experiencing. So if we look at the map that I'm showing here, these are some region-wide estimates of the trajectory of coral cover over time. And you can see that these places with orange circles have experienced dramatic decline and have not recovered. The places in a blue square like Mexico some of the Florida Keys, some of uh, the Virgin Islands, again, continued decline. But then there are places like Bonaire and Curacao and Bermuda, where the coral cover has actually been really stable. And in fact, places like Bermuda still maintain over 35% coral cover across the entire platform. And it seems that Cayman might actually be a very similar situation, um, especially in Little, where you have a lot of corals and they're doing quite well. And uh, there are certain places that this could be considered a refuge or a hope spot. But not just these geographic locations. Another hope spot is deep. So I'm interested in what's happening if you go beyond these shallow water zones, because most of this bleaching is happening in the top 20 feet of water. Right? So if you go a little bit deeper, things like temperature become buffered, things like uh, Pollution are buffered with distance from shore and depth in the ocean. So all of these stressors that are impacting these nearshore shallow reef communities are slightly dissipated the deeper that you go. And this has led people to propose what's called the deep reef refuge hypothesis. And this is posits basically that these corals that are living on deep reefs are going to survive in the face of continued stressful conditions. And because they're going to be reproducing and producing larvae, that eventually those larvae could repopulate the shallow reefs. So this is a refuge for survival of our coral reefs, is existing down here um, below traditional diving limitations. So how do we assess things like resilience or the tolerance of these kinds of organisms to deal with stress? Uh, there are a lot of ways that scientists are, are looking at reefs and trying to determine who's making it and who's not. Uh, one of those things we are doing are transplant experiments. So you take corals and you put them into different conditions and you see how they do. You measure some sort of metric like growth or survival or reproduction. Uh, you can map locations or get really great photogrammetry with AUVs or ROVs. Um, we can monitor how the ocean is changing with things like uh, these monitoring buoys that are always continuously collecting data like temperature, ocean, pH, salinity, any kind of change in ocean conditions, these buoys are out there and taking long-term data. And it turns out that these are really important to understanding how these long-term decadal scale changes are actually impacting our systems. We can go out and take surveys and go back to the same sites and do surveys again and again and see if we're seeing changes in cover, in composition. Uh, if you want to look at fish, a lot of people are using what they call BRUVs, which are baited remote underwater videos. Uh, so you can put down these camera systems and see what kinds of fish come by. Uh, you can deploy in situ or um, in the field type instruments that are also going to be um, addressing oceanographic parameters. Um, and then you can do all sorts of laboratory experiments, looking at things like um, genetic composition and gene expression. So what are we looking at when we're talking about all these different reefs? I'm going to really start to focus more on deep reefs as we move in through this talk. So I just wanted to give you an example of what the different systems look like. Many of you probably have been diving here and, and know all of what these systems look like in Cayman, but you might not know in Bermuda, they're probably a little bit different. We have much lower diversity of corals than you have here. 
Uh, but we still have really high coral cover, like I said. So this is sort of what the shallow water reef system looks like. We have high coral cover, um, high fish diversity. But as you start to move down a little bit deeper, now this is at uh, 30 to 45 meter zone, you start to see a little bit of a change, but you still have the same players in the system. So these are still the same species that are living at 10 feet are living down at 120 feet. So that makes this a really interesting zone. We also have the same fish species and relatively the same composition of the reef. When you start to get much deeper than this though, it changes a lot. So now this is at 60 meters depth, and you can see that all of that structural complexity, all of the rugosity and the big things that are sticking up off the bottom, that's pretty much gone. It's really um, low relief now, low coral cover, but there's actually a lot of fish down here, which I think is really cool. Uh, and we're also finding a lot of lionfish now at these depths, which I'll talk about a bit later as well. Um, so this is the great star coral, which um, is quite abundant here as well. Uh, but you'll see that the, the corals are quite spare, sparse, actually, at this 60-meter uh, depth zone. If you go even deeper than that, this is between 60 and 90 meters. Um, so you can see that the composition now is really different. So now we're not really looking at corals in the traditional sense. These are not reef building corals. They're what we call black corals or the corals that don't have the symbiotic association. So they don't need light, right? So th because there's not enough light down there for them to photosynthesize. Uh, but we do see this transition to a lot of sponges down really deep. So one of the first things that I'm looking at is trying to do that initial assessment of what is down there. Uh, before you can actually address how things are functioning and operating, you need to know who the players are. Uh, so that's really been the first step. And one of the ways that I'm doing that is I'm cooperating with a person, um, Dr. Art Trambanis from the University of Delaware. And he came to Bermuda and brought his AUV, which is called the Gavia. This is the Gavia here. This is me diving underneath it. So that was a really cool experience to be able to dive with the AUV. And the AUV is doing um, side scan sonar mapping of the reef while I'm taking more detailed imagery of the benthos. So we can get a very um, detailed picture of all of the different types of corals that are living in this environment. But not only that, with the AUV now, we can get a really great idea of the slope and the topography of these different sites. So when I do the photogrammetry, we, this is an area that's 100 meters squared. So this is a large area of the reef. But the resolution is such that we can take this small little square here in the corner and zoom in and actually be able to take surface area measurements of all the different corals and identify every species that's present on these large areas of reef bottom, which is really great because then we can also mark these, sp these spots and photograph the same exact plot on a reef you know, once a year, twice a year, however often you want to do it. And you can then look at growth rate overall across different species. You can look at survival or shifts in species composition over time. So once we decide who's down there, we identify the different players in the system, what's enabling them to live there, or um, how are they structured slightly differently. And one of the ways that we can do that is looking at the size of the corals that are there. This is an early study that I did on a reef at 45 meters depth, and I was looking at the great star coral in particular and trying to see how abundant it was at depth and wh what the sizes of these corals were compared to the shallow reef system. So you can see that on the deep reef, there were a lot of these corals, um, significantly more of these coral colonies at depth than there are on the shallow reefs. But what's really interesting is that they were all really, really tiny. So even though there were loads of them everywhere, they were all so small um, that in the end, they didn't differ in the overall percent contribution to the reef system. Um, but the interesting thing is that, in fact, the entire population is shifted towards these smaller individuals at depth. So there's a few things that could be going on here. One hypothesis is that they don't have enough energy actually at these depths because light is really limiting. This is going to limit the ability of those algae to photosynthesize, limit the amount of energy that's being translocated to the coral. So maybe they just can't grow as fast. They can't grow as big. Um, we've also talked about maybe recruitment is in fact 
failing on the shallow reef and we're still seeing recruitment in the deep reef. So potentially this indicates that the population is more stable at depth than that in the shallows. So these are some of the questions that we're trying to tease apart as we move forward. So how are these corals maintained? I just mentioned recruitment briefly. Well, corals are maintained with reproduction, right? Obviously, you have to introduce new individuals into a population in order for a population to maintain itself over time. And they do this sexually, surprisingly. So corals produce sperm and eggs, and they fertilize either internally or in the water column. And they form these beautiful little larvae that swim around settle onto the substrate and then metamorphose into this little tiny flower that looks something like this. And it's an, a critical process because it's really driving the stability of populations. So if you see a lot of recruitment or a lot of influx of tiny little corals or new babies into the system, this indicates that it's a healthy population and that the population could potentially continue to grow over time. If you start to see a lack of these new juvenile corals in a population, this is a big red flag. That means that potentially this population is declining or failing to persist. But the interesting thing about how corals reproduce is, right, once a coral is living on the reef, it can't go anywhere. You know, if it, if it settles and, and grows in little, it's not going to then pick up and move itself to grand, right? But it can do it in this larval stage. So when the larvae are swimming around and trying to find a place to live, they get carried away in the ocean currents and sometimes can end up far, far away in places like Bermuda. And we can actually assess how rapidly or how frequently they're actually migrating between locations with genetics. So by looking at the DNA of these different corals from across different sites, um, so in this study, for example, I went to all these different great locations. It was really hard work. <laughs> and I collected coral, little coral fragments and went back and sequenced their DNA. And then you can see that, oh, it's actually really interesting that the type of reproduction that they have is going to impact how far they can travel. So corals that have internal fertilization actually don't go very far. We find that they, you know, if they are reproducing in Jamaica, then they stay in Jamaica. Uh, whereas those corals that are releasing eggs and sperm into the water and they fertilize in the water column, they can disperse a really long way and you actually have this in huge metapopulation of corals that's interconnected across all of the Caribbean islands. So that's um, an interesting tidbit, I think, on how corals can persist because it indicates that, for example, if you if something happened in a particular location and you lost all of those brooding corals, it's going to be really difficult for that, that coral population to um, recover from that loss because they're only reliant on their local population. So what about these little larvae? I really love larvae. I think they're absolutely beautiful and you can um, start to see the formation of each individual polyp while it's still in the larval stage. Um, and I really like brooding corals as well. They, they are an excellent model system because the fertilization happens inside the coral. The larva is developing inside of the coral. So you can assume that that larva is experiencing the exact same environmental conditions as the parent. Uh, so you can do all sorts of experiments where you're manipulating what the parent is experiencing and then how that in turn is going to affect the long-term development of these individuals. Now, so I look at things like, or I will do things like take an adult from different habitats and collect their larvae and look at how well they're settling and metamorphosing into these initial primary polyps and how well they grow and survive over time under different environmental conditions. So to do that, um, in this study we actually went out to a shallow reef and a reef at 35 meters and we collected the coral Parietes asteroides, it's the mustard hill coral. We brought it into the lab. So we do this in these little jugs because the water in these jugs will flow over the top of the handle and the larvae that are released are buoyant. So they float up to the surface of, this, of the water and then over into the handle into my little collection container. And then I can count every single larva that was released by that individual colony. And then I collect all these larvae like this and subject them to experiments, unfortunately. They're happy at this point, 
<laughs> ah, don't do it to me. Uh, so some of the things I look at are, for example, how well they settle. So looking at across a depth range, if we're looking at inshore patch reefs um, to the rim reef, which I believe um, is referred to as the crest probably here, um, and then as you move off the reef slope onto the upper mesophotic reef or the deep reef at 35 meters. Um, and so this is looking at the number of larvae that the colonies are releasing, and you can see that there was absolutely no difference. So a coral colony collected from an inshore reef site actually released the same number of larvae as a coral collected from 35 meters depth, which is interesting and also great because it indicates that these corals at depth are reproducing. So once those larvae um, come out, we measure them. So we take photographs of them and do surface area measurements. Um, and this is where we start to see some differences now. So now you can see that the larvae released from those parents that were living on the patch reef are significantly smaller than from the other two sites, which may be an indication of some sort of stress because of their proximity to the shore. So we take those little larvae then and we pool them into different groups based on their depth. And we put them in with little what we call settlement tiles, which are just terracotta tiles I get from the hardware store. Put them in these little chambers and we monitor how many of the larvae settle and how well they're growing. So what we found here was that now these larvae that are being released by those upper mesophoto, those deep corals, they're actually having a much higher rate of settlement success than the corals from the other two reef zones. So not only are these deep corals reproducing, but they're producing larvae that are actually settling at a higher rate. And then if we follow them over time, so we followed them for several months, and you can look at the survival over time. So they had higher settlement, and then they had higher survival over time, and they had higher growth rates over time. So not only are they reproducing, and they're reproducing these larvae that have high settlement, but then once those little babies settle, they have a higher percent probability of making it into the community and into the next generation. Um, so this is great for this concept of the deep reef refuge hypothesis because this would indicate that potentially, yes, these deep corals could persist and could eventually help to maintain a stable population. Another way that corals can adapt to different types of stressors is by changing the type of the algae that they associate with. So I didn't mention this before, but there are several different species of algae that corals can associate with. And some of those species are, more, are better at photosynthesizing in high light conditions. Some are better in low light conditions. Some do better in, hot, in hotter temperatures than others. And so the corals, once they bleach and kick out some of those algae, they can then pick or get a new association with a different species of algae that may be better suited for the new condition. Um, but this also happens, you know, depending on where they live. So corals from one site or one depth that are experiencing different conditions from corals, say, on the shallow reef, may associate with a different species of algae because it would be better for them in terms of the energy that they receive. So we looked at this. We collected adult coral colonies from shallow and deep, and we looked at the symbiont community in the adults, and you can see that this is the contribution of the different species of algae, and they didn't differ, which was really surprising. Um, maybe we didn't go deep enough. We were only at 35 meters, so there was no difference. They had the same types of, of algae in them, no matter how deep we went. And then we went and looked at the algae species contribution in the larvae, and they actually only inherited the dominant type of symbiont. But then over time, as they grew and we transplanted them out onto the shallow and the deep reef, they ended up shuffling or changing the types of algae that they associated with to then, as a year later, they mimicked exactly what was in the adult. So it indicates that they do have this capacity to adapt because they have the ability to, to shuffle those associations. It just seems that potentially the environmental differentiation that we were looking at probably wasn't strong enough to elicit a difference in the, their association here. So another thing we can look at is how, are, how does stress affect the next generation? Um, so this is a project I'm working on right now um, with Holly Putnam from University of Rhode Island. 
And we're doing relatively similar um, methodology. So we're collecting corals from different depths. We bring them into the lab, but here now we're stressing those adult corals. So we'll expose the adult corals in the lab to say two degrees higher temperature. And then we collect those larvae and see how those larvae are doing um, compared to corals that were not stressed. Um, and interestingly, we're finding that it seems that they're able to cope with it. And in fact, we then transplanted them back out onto the reef after a stress exposure and brought them back in and did it again. And the ones that had been previously exposed to stress, uh, their larvae did better in stressful conditions. So it does seem that like the corals can adapt to a change in temperature over time. And it can happen even within a single generation, which is really good news. It's just we aren't sure yet if that's fast enough. Um, to keep up with the rate of change that's currently happening. But it's still a positive, um, a positive finding for the trajectory of coral survival. Another thing we're doing is looking at what we call thermal tolerance or thermal performance. Um, so thermal performance is basically how we are assessing this relationship between some sort of performance metric. It can be growth. It can be survival, it can be reproduction, it can be photosynthesis across a temperature range. So we take little fragments of corals and we expose them to a range of different temperatures and we see how they perform. And this will tell us you know, things like what is the minimum temperature that this organism can live in and um, perform well in? What is the maximum temperature that it can withstand before it dies? And what is the optimal temperature for it to exist in. If, if it could live in any temperature, what is that perfect sweet spot for it to survive? And together they can actually indicate the sensitivity of different species to temperature stress. And so we were interested in how environmental history would impact this sensitivity to thermal stress. And so we decided to look at this at two different locations, Bermuda being what we call a cool location and Panama being what we call a hot location. And our hypothesis is that um, those corals that are living in Panama and have experienced hot, hot water for at least a decade are more adapted to that hot water and have a thermal performance curve that's going to be shifted towards hotter temperatures than the corals in Bermuda, which are still not experiencing those extreme heats, ex um, heat periods. All right, so we did this in Bermuda and in Panama. Um, and our goal is really to try to determine what is the trajectory for tolerance over the next century? Can corals deal with it? If they are continuously dealing with increasing temperature, are they going to be able to move their metabolic processes slightly to adjust to that change in temperature? Um, and then we're, again, trying to define this threshold, like what's the maximum temperature that a coral can survive in a different location? And does this differ um, by species? And does this differ across geographic regions? Does it differ across a depth zone? So again, here we have to go out into the field and collect little fragments of corals. Luckily, they're really small, so there we're not, we don't ever take the whole thing, which is good. Um, and we bring them into the lab and put them in our little chambers, which look like this. And these are sealed chambers. And we put an oxygen probe and a temperature probe, and we can measure photosynthesis and respiration over time. And we actually have this really sophisticated um, <clears throat> temperature control system that can maintain temperature to 0.1 degrees Celsius. So we are, have a really tight control over our uh, experimental conditions when we're doing this, even though it's all happening in this big giant um, like bin that you get at the Ace Hardware store. <laughs> so what we found was pretty much exactly what we hypothesized. So the red here are the corals from Panama, and the blue are the corals from Bermuda. And you can see that, in fact, this curve is shifted towards warmer temperatures. So not only is the optimal temperature for metabolism shifted by two degrees warmer, so is that critical maximum temperature. Uh, so it turns out that it, well, it looks like the corals in Panama can, in fact, tolerate a higher temperature threshold than the corals in Bermuda. <clears throat>
So what does this mean? It suggests that there is the scope for adaptation because this means that the corals that are living, these are the same species of corals, but they have historically experienced very different environmental conditions, but they're adapted to those environmental conditions. So potentially as temperatures continue to rise, they can alter their metabolic processes to move these curves slightly warmer. Right? Um, and this is indicated because these corals persisting in cold water have this temperature threshold that's low and the ones that are in hot water have a high threshold. So what I'm interested in next is does this persist across depth? So can we find a similar pattern in depth because one of the things with the deep refuge hypothesis is that temperature is very stable at depth and they don't experience these extreme heating um, periods and so is it, could those thresholds also be lower on deep reefs and what does that mean for bleaching if for example you have an event where the heat does reach depth does that mean that those corals are actually more vulnerable uh, and so this is uh, the next step that I'll be looking at in terms of these thermal performance curves okay so finally another way that corals can adapt and acclimatize to different types of condition is through um, morphological changes, so changes in the way that the colony is structured. And scientists have been actually looking at this for decades. We have some really early work from the 70s looking at how branching corals change in the way that they um, have their branches either farther apart or they become skinnier branches with depth. Um, in Bermuda we found something very similar, so here we're looking at corals um, very shallow at about 10 feet deep and then at 60 meters deep. And we looked at differences in their skeletal formations. Um, and what we found was, in fact, that the corals that are living at depth are flattened out, that the, each individual polyp is like squat, it's, it's shallow, and there's a lot of space in between each polyp. So what we think is going on here is that this is a mechanism for getting more light at depth. Because this way, if you think about you know, these little polyps sticking up off of a colony, if you have them very close together and they're very tall, then the entire side of that polyp is shaded by the polyp next to it. If you're flat and you've got a lot of space between all your neighbors, then everybody's exposed to a lot of light. So this is a way to maximize exposure, <laughs> maximize photosynthesis in a low light environment. What we don't know is, is this evolutionary or is this just you know the coral changing based on uh, based on its condition one way I like to think about this is like if you have a tan or if you don't have a tan like if, if you had no experience with like human anatomy and you went and saw two people like same exact nationalities or even the same family right and one was living in Chicago and one is living in Miami and you're like that person has dark skin and that person has light skin but it, they're actually genetically there is no evolutionary thing going on there it's just exposure to a different environment we can actually test that so we can collect these corals in their very early life stage. Again, I collect larvae. I love the larvae. So the, for this study, I'm collaborating with Tally Mass. She's at Haifa University in Israel. And I went over to Israel last month to start this project. And we went out to deep and shallow reefs and collected the little larvae from the corals. Uh, what's great about this study is we're now using nets to collect our larvae. So we didn't have to remove any of the corals from the reef for this. We bring the, the larvae into the lab, and immediately we saw differences in the structure of the larvae. So you can see this is the same magnification, and the shallow ones are really big, and the deep ones are, are little wee guys. Uh, and so we're doing all sorts of different kinds of experiments with settling them in C2. So some of them get put into little chambers, and we settle them down at 45, 50 meters, and some of them we put in chambers and settle them at 5 meters. And then we look at how the skeleton is forming. The idea being that if you take a coral from 45 meters and you have its little larvae in a chamber, if, you, if it's an evolutionary inherited trait and you put that larva and settle it at five meters, it should form a polyp in the exact same morphology as that coral, as its parent colony from 45 meters. If it doesn't form that, if it starts to form the morphology, of all of the other corals of that species at five meters, then that would indicate that it's what we call plastic. 
So this is kind of what we're doing, and so I just wanted to show you some of the things that we're looking at in terms of how they can change. Um, and we're all, we are finding that it is, in fact, uh, probably plastic. So these are the settlement chambers that we do. We put 50 larvae into each little chamber, and then we collect them after a week and bring them into the lab. So the, one of the first things we did was look at fluorescence, which is really cool. So here, all these little red dots are the algae, and then the green is green fluorescent protein that's just like, uh, it's intrinsic. It, they get it from the time they're born. They have these green fluorescent proteins, and they think of it as like a sunscreen. <clears throat> And we find a lot of it in the deep coral, the deep larvae, which is interesting because you wouldn't think that necessarily they would need a lot of sunscreen because they're from 45 meters deep. Like, I don't know. So that's an, one thing that we're interested in looking at. But then we do uh, SEM, which is scanning electron microscopy of these little settled babies. And we look at how the skeleton <clears throat> is forming. Excuse me. So you can see that both of these larvae came from the shallow reef, and this one was settled at 45 meters, and this one was settled at 5 meters. And you can see that they took up very different skeletal morphologies, even though they were from the same depth zone to begin with. And one of the things that we are looking at is if you see these tiny little squares here, we can zoom into these really interesting features um, that we're finding are consistent between the differences we find in adults. We find that in the juveniles that we're settling out on the reef as well. <clears throat> so it does seem that these little babies are in fact taking on the skeletal morphology of the depth at which they settle, not dependent on the depth that they originally came from. So to summarize all this, I like to think of this as a hope talk. Uh, because what I've been showing you here is that there are all these different mechanisms that corals can use to adapt to different environmental conditions. So they can change things like um, larval exchange or dispersal distances. They can alter things like reproductive traits or reproductive processes, uh, settlement uh, processes. They can shuffle those associations with different types of algae. They can alter their metabolism and photosynthetic rates. They can change their skeletal morphology based on different environmental conditions. And what all this means is that potentially there is a bit of scope for corals in the future to deal with a change in, in temperature, in pH. Um, and so finding these places where corals are doing well is a great place to start with understanding how they're doing well and how they're going to persist in the future. Okay, but before I, I leave you, I have to talk a little bit about lionfish. So Carrie mentioned that I'm the top, what we call the lionfish huntress in Bermuda. Um, and I really fell into the lionfish gig because I was diving deep and there were a lot of them there. Uh, and so <clears throat> I, I was involved with a project that was funded by the Darwin Initiative, which is from the UK, to try to assess where the lionfish are in Bermuda, how many there are and what their impact is. Uh, so we go out and survey lionfish, but then I also look at things like reproduction. This is a lionfish egg. I look at the genetic connectivity or diversity of the lionfish across Bermuda and compare that to the Caribbean. I collect the gametes and look at reproductive stage and how they're developing. And then I give all my fish to local restaurants um, and try to promote a local fishery. So I, I sell to grocery stores and to restaurants and to hotels and really trying to get this on the menu in Bermuda because it really has taken a long time for that to happen. Um, so just briefly, I'm sure you guys are really familiar with this topic, uh, but you know that the lionfish is from the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and it was introduced into the Atlantic in the mid-1980s. Uh, we think from Florida, from the aquarium trade. There were only a handful of fish that were initially introduced, and they very rapidly spread all the way across the east coast of the US, down the coast of South America, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean. So we actually have our southernmost recording is in southern Brazil. And the worry with the lionfish is that they eat a lot, they eat everything, 
and the fish here don't recognize them as a predator, and uh, the predators don't recognize them as food, so they're able to just wipe out the fish population rather quickly. And this could also eventually affect the coral community because if they're eating the herbivores or the fish that eat algae, then the algae could potentially overgrow the corals. So this could be a really bad scenario um, if it were to uh, explode. So one of the things we were tasked with doing again, so we do population distribution. So we go out and do surveys. We look at how many fish, what's in their stomachs, we look at reproduction, um, genetics, and then we're also been, we've been developing traps for some time. So we started out with lobster pots and we modified the lobster pots to try and uh, change like the escape hatch size and the funnel size in the pots to see if that would work because lobster fishermen do get them as bycatch in Bermuda and we don't allow fish traps at all, it's illegal. So we have to, this was sort of our first um, go at that. We have since switched to a different trap, which we call the Giddings trap, which is developed by a NOAA scientist, Steve Giddings, which is like a clamshell trap that um, as you, you drop it down, it opens up on the bottom, and then when you pull it back up, it closes up on itself. We've been having a lot of trouble with it, but um, yeah, really traps haven't, haven't been super successful. I'm gonna be totally honest with that. Um, <laughs> but what we did find was that all the lionfish <clears throat> are hiding out really deep. So we went to all these sites around the island. These are just densities at 60 meters depth. So you can see some of these sites have extremely dense populations of lionfish. Um, and it looks something like this, so I don't know if you can actually see all the different lionfish in this photograph. But if you look at this on a graph, it's pretty striking. I mean, you go from like, you know, you might see one on a dive in the shallows, but you go down really deep and you're, it's just a blanket of lionfish down there. Um, so this, this was a real problem, and so we wanted to determine what was going on. So what you can see in this map here is that there are a lot of fish here and a lot of fish here, but there's no fish up here, even though it's the same depth. So why are there fish in some places and not in other places? Um, so this is one of the things we tried to look at. And so we did some modeling to try to determine the relative influence of things like temperature, uh, prey abundance, and, and uh, biomass. We looked at the abundance of the top three most common fish that we saw at these depths to see if it was related to prey availability. What we found was that the strongest driver was seawater temperature. And they were actually congregating in areas that were cold. And so, this is kind of contrary to what you would think because some of the early studies of lionfish show that they don't reproduce when it gets cold, they don't survive as well when it gets really cold, but apparently they like this, this spot at about 20 degrees C. And what's interesting is that this co-varied with prey fish density and biomass. So I can't really tell you that it's not the fish, their, their food availability. What I think is happening is that these cold sites are sites where there's nutrients being mixed from the deep water, and this is then providing food for all these little fish, so you get dense populations of these little fish, and the lionfish just go there because their food is there. Um, so this is sort of my hypothesis about this, is that you have this thermocline above which you don't have a lot of mixing, there's not a lot of food available for the little fish, and below this, you have all this mixing happening, you have a lot of food, you have a lot of these tiny little fish, and the lionfish are drawn to these sites just to, because their food is there. Uh, so these, this should be like what we're trying to target. So if we know the topography of these deep reefs, we can predict where these areas of mixing can occur, and then we can target those specific sites to find these dense populations of lionfish. Uh, so I just wanted to show you briefly some of this um, outreach that I've been involved with with the lionfish. It was kind of new in Bermuda. They, they didn't allow people to sell lionfish. So first of all, we have, I don't know if you guys have this here too, but we have to get a permit to spear lionfish uh, because you're not allowed to spear fish on scuba. So there was an exception made for lionfish for that and we have to go sit through a class and, uh, before we are allowed to spear lionfish. And then, for the longest time, you weren't allowed to sell those lionfish that you caught. 
Uh, you could eat them yourself, you could give them away, but you weren't allowed to sell them. Um, so I, I had several meetings with the Commercial Fisheries Board and with um, our government agencies, and they finally decided to let the top five people sell their lionfish. So those of us on the, caught the, the top five people that caught the most lionfish were allowed to sell. Um, and so that made a big difference because you can't encourage people to go out there and spend all this time pursuing catching lionfish if they're never going to make their money back on, on that. Um, <clears throat> so we really just wanted to see you know, how much people are willing to pay for a, a dinner for lionfish. So here you can see that the main course, this isn't actually very bad because this is a really high-end restaurant, so I was kind of surprised that the main course is only $34. Uh, but he made a 30% profit margin on, these, on my sales to this particular restaurant. And I sell to him for $12.50 a pound, which is pretty good. So. Is that, is that, um, yeah, is that with a, you've already filleted, or is that? Gutted, but whole. Yep. Yeah. And since then, um, I've had several restaurants jump on the bandwagon. Uh, and so now they do these little promotional happy hour events, and we have special menu nights, lionfish menu nights, uh, where it's uh, marketed quite well across the island um, at Marcus's, Marcus Samuelson's restaurant. So that's all I have. Thank you for coming.